Brandon Hodge. My home is featured on Austin's Weird Homes Tour, and it houses a very special collection. I call this archive, and the general catch-all for my research, the Mysterious Planchette, which is a reference to an early spirit communication device that happens to be my specialty. Within my home, you will find all manner of seance, artifacts, spirit communication devices, and other occult means of communicating with the dead, as well as some other esoteric items of interest. But my real specialty and love is for seance artifacts and devices. And so I'm gonna take you on a little tour today of what some of those items are and kind of give you a, a closer look at some of these things that you might not uh, get to see should you visit the home on the Weird Homes Tour. So we'll jump right into it. As a brief starter, uh, many visitors here at the Weird Homes Tour often run into a fragment of a very important home. And so uh, I've decided to bring out, especially for this video, other fragments that aren't normally seen. What's important about this home is it is where the birth of spiritualism takes place on March, for, March 31st, 1848. It's the home of the Fox family. And within it, they begin to experience strange noises, poltergeist-like activity uh, with knocks, creeps, you know, weird sounds on the walls, and the two young women living there, they're young teenagers at the time, Kate and Maggie Fox, actually established communication with these knocks. And through this and the spread of this news, births what essentially is what will come to be known as modern American spiritualism. And from that, that very simple binary communication with raps and knocks, uh, comes a whole evolution of spirit communication devices. And I have taken it upon myself for it to be my job to collect, document these things, kind of as an occult archaeologist, uh, being how I view myself, tracing the history of spiritualism through the surviving artifacts of that movement. And so, as a callback to that house, many visitors see a shadow box with a, a framed postcard and an iron bar, which was taken from the foundations of the Fox Cottage. And I've brought out a, another little special group of artifacts that I contain within this box. <coughs> and within it, you can see are many fragments that were recovered from the ruins of the Fox Cottage. The Fox Cottage was moved uh, uh, in the 1900s to Lilydale, New York, which is really sort of the, the spiritual, no pun intended, the spiritual center of uh, the modern American spiritualist movement. And uh, it's a Victorian era community of, uh, that still has thriving mediums and practitioners there today. Uh, it was moved there and it actually burned down in, 19, in the 1950s. Uh, but the original foundations stand and uh, they are well kept. And these are uh, some fragments and shards of the, of the foundation and some original wood from the home. Uh, and so that's a kind of a neat introduction that gets us started is the sorts of, some of the sorts of things I collect. But again, really the devices are my specialty. And um, spiritualism progresses from that rapping style of mediumship of the Fox sisters where they're communicating with these raps and knocks that the Fox sisters will later come clean and admit that they were wrapping their toe knuckles and knee joints against the, the, the hardwood floor in order to produce these sounds and communicate with them. But it doesn't matter. The, a worldwide movement had been sparked by their actions. And so you have inventors that come along and try to harness these different powers and these different forms of mediumship in different ways. And one of the primary ways uh, in the early ages, in, in probably the early 1850s, 1852 or so, Spiritualists begin to discover that if they rest their hands upon a table, a stool, a chair, that after a few minutes it will begin to mysteriously move under an agency that was difficult for them to explain. Now, modern scientists attribute this to the ideomotor response, that is, unconscious muscular movement, uh, where our brains don't perceive our own contributions to that movement. So it seemed that these tables were moving miraculously and mysteriously under the agency of spirits. So with that mysterious movement, which we would now recognize in the same way you don't really detect that you're helping push the Ouija board planchette, for instance, for those of you who have, have used a talking board in the past. Uh, but by harnessing that agency, the spiritualist began to refine other means of communication. 
One of the earliest of those moving beyond the table was to try to harness those automatic movements of the table into a smaller device that could write out messages from the spirits. And that really is my specialty, and that's the automatic writing planchette. I have a very early specimen here. This was known as the Boston Planchette and was uh, manufactured by J.W. Cottrell in Boston, who may very well have been America's first manufacturer of the, of the automatic writing planchette. Now, these are invented in Paris in 1853 under the dictation of the spirits, who told a seance group to fetch a basket from the next room and attach a pencil to it, place their hands atop it, and it would begin to move mysteriously in the same way the tables they were using would wrap and knock mysteriously in order to provide communications. And so this is a smaller version of the table. It's a little plank, a, a little board, a planchette. And uh, they harnessed its power with a couple of small wheels. And the third wheel, as it were, is a pencil. So this would be placed on a large sheet of butcher paper, the user's hands placed atop it. And as modern users are familiar with the Ouija board, the planchette would begin to move mysteriously and then write out messages with the attached pencil. So you can see here, this is a 19, early 1860s version of an automatic writing planchette. In 1868, uh, sort of news of the planchette's use, which had been in use for about 15 years by spiritualists, kind of goes viral, if you will. Newspaper reports started to reprint an early uh, story, very sensational story, on the planchette's use, and so they proliferated all over the world. And I have a few other specimens I'm going to give you a closer look at. Probably the kings of planchette manufacturers were Kirby and Company. They had popular songs written about them. Uh, and produced, it is said, up to 200,000 boards in the 1868 Christmas season alone. So they were very prolific manufacturers of these things. And there are even early stories that claim that uh, scientific instrument makers couldn't acquire the small wheels they needed for panographs because the planchette manufacturers were using them all up. So this is an early Kirby and Company planchette. They were competitors to the Boston base. They were in New York, competitors to the Boston base J.W. Cottrell, and often slandered one another in the popular press. But you can see here, it's a similar board, has a distinctive cutout. A lot of companies tried to um, distinguish their products, trying to get it patented. It really wasn't a patentable item, uh, however, but they did try to you know make some improvements on it in, in hopes they could be patented. And so you'll even see here on this label, it says, patent applied for here, which unfortunately for them uh, was not going to be granted uh, to protect them in the marketplace. And at this point, it's a full-on craze. And, and booksellers and stationers all over the country are producing these things. This is one of Kirby and Company's wooden examples. They had three different wooden models, uh, the number zero, the number one, and the number two. Uh, we don't know which was which. They sort of increased in grade, but the surviving advertisements uh, don't give us a lot of hints as to uh, what was better than, than the next. And so uh, I would predict this is probably a number one planchette. Um, but Kirby and Company produced more than wood planchettes. Their number three planchette is a real favorite. Uh, this is the number three India rubber planchette. Now this is manufactured from a form of plastic early form of plastic known as ebonite. This would have been one of the earliest commercially manufactured plastics in the country. And uh, you can see here, it's got that similar heart shape. And uh, what was important about this one is it was, it was seen as uh, insulated from uh, magnetic influence. So they're taking a cue from the mesmerist and the early galvanic scientist and early battery theory and essentially trying to insulate this board so it can operate uh, free from human influence other than your fingers touch it and the spirits are able to more easily move uh, move the item. And so you can see other than a, uh, just a few, I think there's six uh, you know metal screws on here, it is otherwise all ebonite uh, and uh, probably manufactured by the good uh, early version of the Goodyear company who has their stamps on some early uh, Kirby and Company wheels. But the penultimate writing device and one of the favorite planchettes in my collection is the Kirby and Company number and that's their plate glass planchette. So I've actually got a theory that my research has uncovered that this guy right here, C.H. Farley, whose business card I have here, 
uh, partnered up. He's a glazier in Portland, Maine, and he's a scientific instrument manufacturer who kind of goes to the press claiming that he was the first person to do planchettes. Wasn't true, but he did believe it. And there's a newspaper story that says that C.W. C.H. Uh, Farley um, uh, had partnered up with the Kirby uh, Kirby Company. I actually own C.H. Farley's eyeglasses right here, so I collect all sorts of related artifacts to to the items in my collection. Uh, and likely through the influence of C.H. Farley, Kirby and Company announces their number four. You can see where this is going. It's plate glass, it's clear, you can actually see. It's got fantastic, you know, uh, bone wheels, brass hardware, and you can actually see the writing being produced as it's written, making for much more legible spirit communications. And so uh, it's just, you know, just beautiful, beautiful. It says improved planchette engraved there on top of the brass casters. If you'll pardon the, the fingerprints. It's got the elegant, typically American heart shape. And uh, it's just really the penultimate writing, uh, spirit writing device for automatic writing and, and ghost writing. And uh, planchettes took on all sorts of forms. Here in the States, the heart shape uh, was the most popular. But in the UK, they conformed a little more closely to the original illustrations from that article I mentioned that kind of caused planchettes to explode in popularity. And so the British tended to stick to that original illustration with a flat back and kind of a blunt nose rather than the heart shape. And this is a probably a early 1900s uh, Jackson Sun specimen made by the famous toy makers who popularized the modern style of chess pieces. So uh, you have that there. Um, other forms of the planchette went a little further afield. For instance, the hand theme, the hand of fate, the mystic hand, uh, often came into play. And you have several specimens that, that it look kind of like this. This is a, a, a 19 teens Jenison Grove mystic artist with a, a neat little pencil uh, retainer there. You could kind of turn it off, turn it on, and get to writing. And so it's got this sort of distinctive hand shape. And others, uh, such as C. Alexander's, um, uh, writing planchette actually had a luminous element, a little radium painted dot on his forehead there. It had the famous mentalist face, uh, famously turbaned face there. Uh, and uh, it's got a little removable plug right here where you could put a pencil in and produce automatic writing or replace the plug and there was a fold-out sheet, essentially a Ouija board, um, that you would place upon it and, uh, and receive communications letter by letter. There are a lot of transitionary devices as we sort of make our way through the decades toward the Ouija board, which won't debut for really another 30 plus years. And um, I have some of those in the collection, including this beautiful, I just love the grunginess of this one, this beautiful Hudson Tuttle psychograph or dial planchette. It's an early form of a Ouija board. It does predate the board by, uh, by uh, several years. And as you can see, it's all one piece. It relies on an alphabetic form of communication and this disc would turn. It has some old crusty ball bearings under there that have actually survived intact after all these years. And this disc would turn mysteriously under your hands and spell out letters and messages one letter at a time. The Hudson Tuttle dial planchette or psychograph. Um, other sort of uh, false starts, uh, as it were, uh, into that would, would come into being. And even after the advent of the Ouija board, um, you have a lot of devices that tried to rely on different means of movement. Um, we'll get to the Ouija board in a second, but I wanted to, to, to point out a, a few of my favorites from my walls. Uh, this one, for example, is the George Pearson cable graph. Now, this is the early version. He patented this device twice. Once, about a decade after the Ouija board uh, exploded in popularity. And uh, we know that because its patent drawing was just for the case, which had this distinctive lucky horseshoe shape, the, the magnet, you know, the magnetic shape, uh, not only for, you know, the, the lucky horseshoe, but also uh, the, the, the magnetic influence that was thought to uh, help aid in the movement of these devices and facilitate their communications. And this, as you can probably guess by now, operated by placing your hands on this pendulum 
And as it moved back and forth, it would spell out communications letter by letter. This did come out after the Ouija board, but uh, he produced these for a long time. Very few of them exist today, but I am lucky enough to have his 1919 patent version. It's contained right here in its original box. Very rare uh, to see boxes surviving. That's the only one that we're aware of that has survived to the modern day. And uh, his later version of the cable graph, a little refined, but a little less elegant is here. Uh, gone is the pendulum and the thick hand-carved board, uh, and, and you can see it still retains the horseshoe element. Works a little less smoothly, but probably easier for Mr. Pearson to have produced. So this came from 1919. But we've gotten a little ahead of ourselves on the talking board front, and a lot of people are often curious when the Ouija comes about. Spiritualists have been using, as, as we can see from like the Tuttle Psychograph, have been using different types of communication devices uh, with involving letters and numbers for a number of years, all the way back to wrapping mediumship where you would call out the alphabet uh, or, um, or point to it on a card, for instance. But uh, by 1886, there's, again, kind of a viral news story that, that's reprinted in papers all over the country about this new talking board or the new planchette that spiritualists were using in Ohio. And this will uh, spread and die down. And then in 1890, Charles Kennard, and possibly along with, most likely along with, with a gentleman named E.C. Reich in Chestertown, Maryland, um, kind of reinvent this idea. Uh, don't reinvent it. They, they kind of reignite this idea, and it becomes a popular local item at parties. And Charles Kennard gets the idea to commercialize this item, this flat board with a, with a, a separate and removable planchette. And he brings this idea with him to Baltimore and launches the, uh, the Kennard Novelty Company to produce what will come to be named the Ouija board. I have an original Kennard Ouija board here in the collection, several in fact, and you can see that here. So this would have been America's first uh, likely first mass-produced talking board. There is some dispute if the uh, if another toy company, uh, the W.S. Reed Toy Company, actually produced theirs first. We know they produced at least one and sent it to President Grover Cleveland on the occasion of his marriage. But the uh, the sort of claim to fame is largely going to rest with Ouija. It's going to become the the famous version. Uh, and, uh, and kind of the, the, the trademark that will, that will come to be known uh, famously and uh, in, inducing shutters all across America. It would be paired at this time with a paddle-shaped planchette and you can see it, uh, it's on four legs with some smooth um, velvet on the bottom and it, it operates quite smoothly. So this would have pointed out um, messages from beyond, just like so, letter by letter, moving mysteriously in the same way that the planchette had decades before. There's lots of version of these. Of course, uh, the Ouija will be is still produced to this day. It's now a registered trademark by the Hasbro uh, by Hasbro. Get that there. Uh, I've brought another specimen here. This is the Volo. This was actually uh, made by one of the founders uh, of, of the Ouija Novelty Company, uh, uh, but was made as a competitor board. This one is exceptionally rare, and you'll see it works in the same way. I have kind of a later era Ouija planchette uh, that you can see will eventually take on more of a planchette-like appearance. It will adopt the more teardrop or heart-shaped, uh, and will have much shorter legs, and then they're gonna add a window in about 1915. So uh, you can either look through the window or use the, the pointer. And so uh, the Ouija will become sort of the predominant mode of spirit communication from decades on out and is now kind of considered the default apparatus through which spirit communications are obtained. I try not to take that too personally, given my preference for automatic writing planchettes, but history does what history does, and it's just my job to sit here, research it, and try to settle it for the rest of us. So... I really appreciate you joining in. That's just a small taste of my collection. And I hope you'll join me on this year's Weird Homes Tour. Date to be determined, but stay tuned. And I hope you'll come by and see me and let the spirits give you a good talking to. Thank you.